Good afternoon or good evening or good morning, depending on where you are or, of course, when you're watching this. As we know, often people are watching these later. Uh, my name is Jay Shamba. I'm the director of the Institute for International Economic Policy, or IIEP, here at George Washington University. We at IEP are very pleased to be hosting this event on Black politicians during Reconstruction, Impacts and Backlashes as part of our Facing Inequality series. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, IEP is located at the Elliott School at George Washington and is a cross-school interdisciplinary research center at GW. We aim to serve as a catalyst for high-quality multidisciplinary research on policy issues surrounding economic globalization. That's a mandate we interpret rather broadly. Um, and so it includes research around topics on trade, international finance, uh, development economics, poverty studies, inequality, climate change, and economic policy more broadly. Um, and we also have some focuses on China's and India's economy. Um, we've been quite busy at IEP over the last few years. Um, with many virtual events, including some in-person events and more of those as we as we go along. Um, so I invite you to take a look at our website where you can see upcoming events, but you can also find past events and the videos of those past events. I also believe we have a YouTube channel if you'd like to find just you know stream all day of, of this kind of content. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the IEP executive circle for their support and welcome any members in attendance. Um, and so now I'd like to kind of kick off today's event. And so just in general, first tell you that, so as I mentioned, this is part of our Facing Inequality series. So that series is something founded about two years ago. Um, the goal is to be highly interdisciplinary. And so we've always got, um, it's co-organized uh, currently by myself and Trevor Jackson, a historian here at GW. Um, and we typically have people who are presenting in one discipline and then discussants from um, possibly that discipline, but also from another discipline as well. This event, in some sense, um, is, is interdisciplinary from the start, as our speaker, Trevon Logan, is himself um, someone who works across disciplines, and even in general, economic history itself is always a bit of a blend across um, disciplines. So we're really looking forward to today's conversation. As I mentioned, the topic is Black Politicians During Reconstruction, Impacts and Backlashes, and our speaker is Trevon Logan. He's the Hazel C. Youngblood, Youngberg, sorry, a distinguished professor of economics um, at, Ohio, at the Ohio State University. Um, and um, he's also a research associate at the NBR and a proud graduate of uh, UC Berkeley's economics department where he got his PhD. Um, Trevon is a noted scholar uh, in economic history and on race, as well as a whole range of other topics and uh, we're really looking forward to hear him talk today about two different papers um, in this area. We have two terrific discussants. Um, Shari Eli is an associate professor of economics at the University of Toronto and a noted economic historian. And John Clegg is a historical sociologist uh, who studies structures of race and class and is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Economic History at the University of Lund. Um, and so we expect to have quite a bit of time for conversation after the initial presentations. And so I would encourage you to use the Q&A function. If there are any questions you'd like to start queuing up and then I'll be able to bring those questions forward to the group later on. So at this point, I'd like to turn things over uh, to you, Trevon, um, and let you take over. Thank you, Jay. And thank you, Trevor, uh, for this invitation. And I'm very excited to hear um, from both uh, Shari and, and John, who I've known um, for some time, uh, either during this project I'm about to speak about, uh, or um, uh, even before that in certain cases. So um, getting right into this, uh, I'm gonna blend, um, sort of briefly summarize two uh, related papers that look at uh, the political economy of, of Black Reconstruction. And um, their papers are intimately related to an, a really uninvestigated piece of economic history and political history, which is the really first um, truly democratic uh, elections that we had in the United States, what they did for racial diversity among representation and among representatives, and then whether that actually had effects on policy and then how that ended um, with Southern redemption. So, and thinking about that, 
Um, I'm asking a series of related questions in this project overall. So the first is, you know, what are the racial political economy dynamics of reconstruction? And when I began this project, say six years ago, um, I didn't think it would be as pertinent of a question as it is today. But this question in particular is one that has hung around um, for quite some time as we think about not only our discussions of history, the role of race and history in the United States, but also what it means for contemporary policy as, as well. Um, the next question is, is a more particular question that political scientists have wanted to answer for some time, which is does politician race have an effect outside of the racial composition and preferences of the electorate? Now, all the way back to say the median voter theorem, you would think that political representat uh, representatives themselves don't have any direct impact on policy. They are simply you know, reflections of the median voter in, in their um, particular areas. And so if that would be true, then there wouldn't be a race effect, say even to the election of black politicians, they would simply reflect a change in the electorate. And so there wouldn't be any residual effects of, of race. But when we see that and apply to questions, for example, of gender and representation in a number of studies across the world, we do see that individual um, politicians' demographics can influence outcomes above and beyond the uh, electoral composition of their uh, representing bodies. And then I wanted to ask a subsequent question, which is what happened to these uh, successful black politicians? Why did they, um, we know how they came about, we know the broader topics about how they came to an end, but was there anything about their particular uh, efficacy that led them to then be out of office or where they met um, and reconstruction came to an end? So um, not to uh, leave anyone in mystery, the key findings are, are, are straightforward and I'll walk through them in the next several slides. But what I do find is that the uh, effect of black politicians was actually quite pronounced. So the marginal effect of a black politician on local public finance was about nine cents per capita. Um, and in thinking about a causal estimate of a black politician and their effect on local public finance, um, the estimates are actually twice as large, about 20 cents per capita. That is actually about an hour's wage um, at the time uh, for a laborer. And so this is a pretty significant effect on public goods provision and in fact, um, resources for public goods at the time. Um, Black politicians did have a large impact on human capital, um, but they did not have as large an effect on land reform or what we would consider to be today something that would uh, be called wealth redistribution. And then uh, in terms of answering that third question, it is the case that black politicians were met with extreme violence in the areas where they were most affected. Uh, and I'll, I'll walk through what I mean by that later on, but when we see this effect of black politicians on public finance, those who have the largest effects on public finance were also the ones who were most, most likely to be met with forms of physical violence at reconstructions end. So in thinking about black politicians, one of the things that I did uh, in this project was work through very slowly in the narrative record, the political objectives of black politicians. And so it would be um, straightforward to just take the candidate demographics and, and think about estimating an equation, but it's really important to go through the narrative record to understand what it is that black politicians themselves were saying about the policies that they wanted to pursue and where the policies that they wanted to pursue were very different from the policies of white politicians at the time. And there were two areas in which black politicians had broad agreement on the policy objectives and the mechanisms and where they were really at odds with local white politicians on the same issue. And they were thinking about uh, land reform and taxes on land itself and in education. So the policies that black politicians advocated in terms of land reform was very different from the idea of having uh, state policies where you would have taxes on land, if the taxes were not paid, the state would confiscate the land and sell it in small plots. What black politicians actually advocated for um, was an actual increase in taxes on the land as a means of redistributing land to formerly enslaved people. And the reasons for this are actually quite clear from the economic history record. Although we know that the South had high levels of agricultural productivity, it is also the case that the South had more land in inventory than the North and other parts of the United States. So the move of aggressive property taxation by black politicians was in essence a way of trying to raise the opportunity cost 
of holding land in inventory. And this was true at the time in the South when, when land prices were increasing. So if they could move this land into production, one of two things could occur. They would either sell the land because they didn't want to pay property taxes on land that was not in production, or they would put the land into production, which would obviously put more land in production and could in fact increase uh, demand for labor and, and lead to wage increases for African-Americans to work the land. And so this policy that Blacks advocated was very different from direct confiscation. Um, that is what some people had argued for, and that was going to be um, pretty unpopular actually in the North to just have government seizure of land and then redistribute, redistributing it to the public. In terms of human capital policy, uh, Black politicians, and we know this all the way back from Du Bois, were voicing their support for the establishment and the regularization of public education in the South. Um, the public schools in the South were much more important than, say, Freedmen's Bureau schools for the education of Southerners generally, not only Black, but white as well. And before this time, before Reconstruction, the South had very little public education, and its relative investment and enrollments lagged the rest of the nation actually until the middle of the 20th century. Um, there were some attempts to use federal funds for education, but they were not successful. Education was particularly at that time financed exclusively at the local level. The local public finance was particularly important in reconstruction and the consolidation of educational finance into state provided resources came actually after the end of reconstruction. So during reconstruction, the uh, main mechanism to increase education and public education expenditures was to have increased local uh, taxation and that taxation would fund public education. So for this project, uh, both parts of this project, I used data from uh, Foner's Freedom Lawmakers, um, which is the most comprehensive source for black office holders during reconstruction. Um, it states that it has information on all major black officials. It of course does not um, have information on every black official, but it does uh, have the most comprehensive coding of black politicians who are serving down to the area in which they served and the offices in which they held. But it is not a comprehensive uh, dictionary or database of all blacks who were elected to office during reconstruction. It is the most comprehensive that we have that has been well published and vetted by the uh, historical profession. Um, these officials had various ranges of power from being state school superintendents to being uh, members of Congress and to being members of state represent uh, representatives as well, but they had control over day-to-day -day matters like public expenditures, um, the focus of what I am working on, uh, poor relief, administration of uh, justice, and taxation policy. So they did have real impact on the day-to-day -day lives of, of Southerners. And this really comes against this narrative from Reconstruction that Black politicians were ineffective um, and that Black politicians were holding offices that were much more ceremonial than actually uh, having administrative power. Now, this is a historical uh, source of politicians. And is it a biased sample? In other words, if I'm going to find that the politicians were particularly effective, I'm probably going to be biased if what is being recorded in the historical record is of course information about the most successful black politicians. Given the historiography of reconstruction, however, it's unlikely that I have particularly positive selection on the recorded officials. And that's for a couple of reasons. The first is this work that I'm doing here and, and Foner's uh, work, which is coming out of this Du Boisian um, revisionist tradition uh, of reconstruction is actually overturning a much earlier school uh, coming about um, that was saying that Reconstruction was a failure and that Reconstruction was in fact inept Black politicians. So the earliest historical records that we have in the narrative, the earliest historiographies of Reconstruction, to the extent that they record the activities of Black politicians, tend to record them for negative purposes. So the ones that we know in the historical record that we would have to track would actually be biased in the opposite direction. So a big part of Foner's project was to bring in a full and comprehensive listing of the black politicians that existed. Even into the 1960s, you would see, um, you would see traditional 
tracks of uh, reconstruction, which would make literally uh, empirically uh, false statements about black politicians. For example, saying that they were illiterate when you find them in the census records and find that that's simply not true. So these black politicians who are appearing in Foner's Freedom Lawmakers probably actually will be negatively selected, um, although he is trying, of course, to have more comprehensive um, data set. So this data that I'm using here is restricted to office holders. It would not meet that larger um, political science definition of elites or, 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 or you know, general people who might influence policy. I'm really talking about people who are holding elected office. So I'm not including party officials. I'm not including journalists. I'm not including other political actors. I'm not including those who were representing districts for the state constitution ratification process that occurred in, in reconstruction. These are those who held office subsequent to that. So I'm testing for the effect of black politicians on county taxes. And that's going to net out the effect on state taxes and, and, and municipal uh, taxes because they're set at a different administrative level. But it's also really important because local county taxes are particularly important at this time for the provision of public goods. And intuitively, what I'm looking at is that county tax revenue should be a function of local economic conditions. It should be a function of the value of property in a particular area. It should be a function of the political preferences of the electorate there. And that could also be, of course, itself a function of the demographics of an area. So my approach here is to control for those differences to the best extent possible, and then estimate the effect of black politicians on per capita county tax revenue net of those controls. In other words, if politicians have some effect by nature of them being black politicians, then they would have an effect that would go above and beyond these controls for the value of property, um, local economic activity, political preferences, and the demographics of the electorate. So what you're estimating here is a very simple OLS regression where I'm estimating county taxes in a county I and state S in 1870 as a function of the number of officials that are in an area and a series of controls for land values, the percent of the population that is black, the size of the population overall, um, the average wage of manufacturing, um, the manufacturing value of manufacturing output, of county illiteracy rates, the Republican vote share in the 1868 presidential election, looking at um, measures of segregation, racial segregation, residential segregation, whether the county has real access, water access, and, and whether the county is urban. And then a state fixed effect. So I'm only looking at variation in county taxes within a state as a function of these black politicians. And so when you estimate that simple relationship, you find that black politicians, uh, each black politician increases county per capita taxes by about nine cents per person, so around 10 cents. And so even when you're including, for example, these uh, direct measures of say the county's wealth, and when I'm including um, the Republican vote share in the 1868 presidential election, it doesn't do away from the independent effect that black officials have on, proper, on uh, county taxes per capita, which is around nine cents. But the problem with that is, of course, that Black politicians might be endogenous to the preferences of the electorate, right? That's the main endogeneity issue that I need to solve here. So what I'm doing to overcome that, rela that endogenous relationship is I use the within-state distribution of free Blacks in 1860 as an instrument for Black office holders during Reconstruction. And so the reason I can use that is that it's well motivated by the historical record. We know that persistently um, there was Black political representation where there were free Blacks and that free Blacks were overrepresented relative to their share of the Black population as office holders during Reconstruction. And so I would expect that the within state correlation of free Blacks with Black office holders to be strong, right? That's one of the first conditions for the instrument. And theoretically, it could be the case that the utility of a free Black's ideal policy could be greater than that of a freedman, someone who had been formerly enslaved up to the emancipation, be, and they might be more likely to be candidates. 
And that could be greater private gains. They could be more likely, of course, to have businesses that would um, seek to use their political offices to enrich themselves. And there could also be differences in the cost of seeking office for free Blacks. That's not likely, but that could also be the case. But when I use this instrumental variable as a way of thinking about a causal estimate of Black politicians on public finance, we find that this relationship goes from being around 10 cents to actually doubling and being uh, 20 cents. And the result is actually quite robust. And I'll, I'll leave for the, the Q&A um, the questions that I would have about, for example, the ways in which this instrument is robust, the ways in other sort of checks that I do, checks by types of offices and other sorts of robustness checks for it. But everything checks out to the extent that the causal effect as best that I can estimate it of black politicians on local public finance um, was significant. The question is, did it actually persist? Right, if we're thinking that these black politicians simply reflect local preferences for redistribution, then those same local areas, right, who would not have had an experience of a preference shock because of reconstruction, would persistently have higher rates of taxation after reconstruction's end. And so another check on this idea that it actually is the black politicians themselves who are having this effect on these outcomes is to see if they actually persist when these politicians are out of office. When you look at the change in taxes between 1870 and 1880, you will find that the result is negative and literally undoes everything that happened in reconstruction. So it isn't the case that these places that are represented by black politicians that have higher per capita county taxes in 1870 have them persistently over time. What happens is when reconstruction comes to an end, these same areas that had black politicians and that had higher levels of taxes per capita revert back to lower levels immediately after the end of reconstruction. So there's nothing in these local areas which says that they have as political preferences, some taste for redistribution um, that was um, met after reconstruction's end. And so the counties with more black politicians during reconstruction had actually slightly lower per capita county taxes in 1880 than they had in 1870. And I can find that a one standard deviation change in black uh, politicians during reconstruction results in a 0.85 standard deviation change in per capita county taxes after reconstruction. So what is happening is it's literally undoing the effect of reconstruction. That points in the direction of the fact that the black politicians themselves were actually quite effective at the time in which they served, but that certainly once blacks were not participating in the political process and the black politicians were out of office, these they reverted back to very much antebellum uh, political norms in terms of redistribution. So the end of black political leadership more than reversed the tax effects of blacks during reconstruction. So black office holders were related to increased taxation and human capital for exposed children. And I do this in a couple of different ways. One of the first ways that I do in the paper in terms of looking at human capital is taking census level um, estimates of literacy by age cohorts and finding that areas where black politicians served had higher rates of adult black literacy generations later than areas where black politicians did not serve. You can also take the complete count census and you do have a problem there of looking at migration over time. But if you take the complete count census say in 1910 or 1920, and you look back to where 40 and 50 year old people were living at the time of reconstruction, you find that those who were living in counties that had black politicians, African-Americans have higher literacy rates. It's also the case that the gap between the races in literacy is smaller in areas where black politicians serve, consistent with their investment in public education. When it comes to land reform, I find no effects. So there is a small increase in the amount of tenant farming versus sharecropping in the areas where black politicians served, but there is not a large change in the redistribution of farms and, and average farm size and in other things that will be consistent with large scale redistribution uh, of land, even amongst whites, right, in this uh, effect from black politicians. So I don't find that at all. 
Um, this actually is the first quantitative evidence that's in line with this revisionist history of reconstruction, which begins with, with Du Bois's Black Reconstruction and that continues on uh, to and through uh, Forner's Reconstruction. And so this reconstruction era political games by African Americans and by Black politicians in particular is a significant and I would argue omitted factor in Black economic history and particularly in the history of African American human capital formation because of the large effects of Black politicians on educational outcomes for Black children at the time. So what happens to those Black politicians? So I've talked about how successful Black politicians were, and we've talked about how they have uh, led to an increase in per capita uh, taxation. And then what happens when Reconstruction comes to an end? And narrative historians suggested that Black politicians were in fact targeted for their tax policies, that part of what we take as a regional or perhaps um, uh, a, a Southern distinction of not liking uh, public finance is likely not necessarily true. And so I'm very happy to have this discussion with Shari, who has a great paper that looks at Confederate widow pensions, which of course are public programs strongly supported in Southern states, but one that is racially exclusive. And so Black politicians weren't necessarily targeted because of their high levels of taxation or by supporting uh, public goods, but they might have been targeted for supporting public goods for African-Americans. And so I take that conjecture that Black politicians were targeted for their tax policies, demonized for their tax policies, to the data to see if there's a relationship between taxes and Black politicians who were subsequently met with violence. And so if we're looking at this baseline level, right, if you had no black officials in 1870, your per capita county taxes were around 90 cents per person. If you had a black official in 1870 in your county, the average level of per capita county taxes was a dollar and 50 cents. If you were living in a county where African-American politicians were subsequently attacked during Southern Redemption, your per capita county taxes were nearly $2. And if you'll note what happens in 1880 is that the counties where there was violence against black politicians, of course, occurring between 1870 and 1880, saw almost a complete reversion of their county taxes back to a level that was consistent with the places that never had black officials in 1880. And even if you're looking at the change in 1880 per capita uh, tax revenue here, we once again see no effect if you had black politicians. So this reversion of all of these counties back to a level that's consistent with there being no black political representation itself differs by whether or not you had more aggressive levels of taxation during reconstruction and then subsequently violence against those politicians, those black politicians in those areas. So if we look at the simple relationship between the, um, the probability of an attack and the taxes in 1870, we find that that relationship is positive. If you look at the number who are attacked, and, and the number who are attacked and the number of attack. And if you look at which whether there is a violence against black politicians, those are both positively related to the tax levels in 1870. And this is the first evidence that black taxation policy is related to the violence that black politicians met with during the end of reconstruction. And to be clear about this violence, this is violence that leads at, at it includes up to death of politicians, but others can be being um, run out of town, for example, having their family and family members threatened and other forms of political violence. We know that tens of thousands of African-Americans were killed in acts of political violence concentrated between 1874 and 1880. And a lot of this political violence occurred around election days and were acts of explicit um, voter intimidation. This includes, uh, of course, massacres that in the end are ruled constitutional or at least where the enforcement acts 
could not protect African Americans uh, from this form of political violence. By the time the Supreme Court rules that the Enforcement Acts cannot be used to stop political intimidation of African Americans, there was widespread political attacks on African Americans more generally to stop them from voting. And even if they did win elected office to get them to resign from office before they actually held office. Now, one other thing that I think that you'd want to deal with in this is whether or not this is related to violence in general. And so maybe it's not actually about political violence and about um, taxation policy and about that politicians, maybe what this is really about is just the fact that these are violent places that have a lot of interracial violence, right? And so if these are places that have a lot of interracial violence, I can see whether or not lynching is related um, to black political violence. In other words, in the areas where I see black political violence and I see aggressive acts against black politicians during Southern redemption, do I subsequently see that these are places that have a higher number of lynchings than other localities? And so this is only suggestive because political violence itself could of course obviate the need for, for later lynching. And if I'm thinking about the work of scholars such as Jacoba Williams, who has a fascinating project on the effect of lynching um, from the late 19th century to the middle of the 20th century on contemporary voting behavior among African Americans, you can think about this early political violence not needing to have subsequent lynching violence. But if that is the case, there would still be this relationship, you would think, between sort of political violence and later acts of, of lynching to the extent that they're about political intimidation. What I find here is no relationship between lynchings and violence against Black politicians. So although lynching is about voter intimidation, and we know that from a range of research today in both sociology, political science, and, and economic history, the relationship is not the same as the political violence which met Black politicians. And this is consistent then with my argument that Black politicians were signaled out because they were successful in raising county taxes as politicians in the 18, uh, late uh, 1860s and early 1870s. So this act of political violence against Black politicians is not about voter suppression as lynchings and other forms of political intimidation are. This is really about punishing successful Black politicians. So it's important to note that these studies sort of when taken together, don't consider all violent acts. And the focus on taxes and Black politicians allows me to look at the role that tax policy played on violence against Black officials, but it's unknown whether this relationship extends to violence more generally. And the, the sort of elephant in the room here is going to be voter intimidation of African-Americans overall. But further research documenting the number of violent acts during Reconstruction, discerning the motivations behind uh, the racial violence that we see will aid in answering those sorts of questions. So the main thrust of this research is about showing the efficacy of Black politicians during Reconstruction and then how that efficacy was violently thwarted at the end during Southern Redemption leading to lower levels of public goods provision in the South, higher rates of racial inequality on all dimensions in the South, has its seeds not only in enslavement, but in an incomplete birthing of democracy in the South in the Reconstruction era. Great, thanks so much, Trevon. That was a terrific tour of two papers, which is, uh, very hard to do, I think, sometimes to, to bring two papers together um, at once. I think um, it occurs to me, we didn't actually discuss the order uh, before, but I think in, in the order on the agenda, it had uh, Sherry first. So I was going to turn to Sherry first um, to, to offer some comments and then to John. Um, I want to encourage people to go ahead and put any questions you have in the Q&A. Um, and after the discussants and Trevon has had a chance to, to reply, um, we'll bring some of those uh, questions to the floor. Uh, so uh, Sherry, please go ahead. Can everyone see this? Yes. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm delighted to get the chance to comment on these two papers. 
Um, I thoroughly enjoyed reading them and um, as usual, learned so much from, from reading Trevant's work. Um, okay, so let me just take a step back first and say um, the focus of the literature on the post-war South um, in economic history uh, has really focused on the lack of land redistribution after the war and on inequality in education. Uh, specifically, there has been a focus on um, elites in the South purposely trying to undereducate uh, Black children in schools to prevent uh, migration northward in the next generation and maintain uh, laborers in agriculture, for example. Um, there's been uh, lots of work on the lack of growth um, in the postbellum period and specifically on sort of, as Gavin Wright calls it in Old South, New South, this backwardness of uh, the South that persists for a hundred years after uh, the end of the Civil War and is the result of reliance on cotton agriculture. But there has been so much less um, on the impact of, of Black elites and specifically Black politicians. And, and I'm so delighted to see, to really see this come to an end. Um, also just taking one last step back, um, why has there been less research on the experience, um, even at the individual level of African-Americans in the post-war South? In part, it's because it's really difficult um, to measure their experience. So white men born in, in the US are often easier to find in records. Um, there's so much less research on African-Americans after the Civil War because they're, they experience name changes, um, have higher rates of illiteracy, and so it's difficult uh, to find them consistently in, in records over time. And that's another reason why studying Black elites is so long overdue because in fact they're easier to find in records since they're very prominent uh, in the community. And then there's been um, in recent years in, in the economic history literature, uh, lots of emphasis on establishing uh, causation. And then the research questions that you get to ask and answer become really narrow. Um, and so in this search for shocks and accidents that divide populations into treatment and control groups, you you get to make causal claims, but the, the implication is that you have a real loss of, of context when we think about economic history as sort of being the result of this series of accidents. And so this is what I really enjoy about Trevon's work is that he, he's really adding so many layers here. Um, so while uh, being able to establish causation, um, he's, he's focusing on black politicians uh, and their really crucial importance without uh, having to go to making comparisons to white politicians. And this is really marking a change in, in the way we, we tell history. Um, I couldn't agree more that these papers are such great compliments to, to each other and uh, they should always appear together on syllabi. Um, the, in the first paper, the what we see is the importance of black politicians in affecting change for the black community, um, but ultimately uh, have to think about how powerful uh, they remain um, in light of, of violent acts uh, in the, that are the focus of the white lashing paper. Um, so together, there's a real unpacking of the way in which we uh, tell the history of reconstruction and, and we see uh, the story from a new angle. Um, I, as I was reading this, I was very excited by the possibility of uh, collecting more information on uh, Black politicians. Um, so you already have matches to the census, have literacy and occupation measures. Is there, and I know this is such a tall order, but is there a way to really build out um, more to really build more information for each politician uh, from ancestry, family search, my heritage, and these other genealogical websites. Could you find them in like census records, war records, gravestones, um, and even like even potentially DNA records? I don't know if you want to go that 
that road, but I was thinking like within black politicians, like what are the um, characteristics that seem to guide differences in outcomes? Is there something you could do? I know you're looking at the 1920 census, but could you even look at the effects um, on intergenerational outcomes? If you consider these other outcomes, I'm, I'm curious to know, you know, what are, what are the effects of seeing um, black politicians and uh, in your county and in the 1860s and 70s? Um, and then I wanted to say, how, you know, can, can you say more about how black politicians are, are changing public finances? So um, my sort of framework for this for thinking about this is that in the second half of the 19th and early 20th century, um, politicians get to decide who's deserving of aid and who isn't. And so we see all of these public assistance programs emerging across the US funded by public and private charity at the local and state level. Uh, these programs uh, provide aid to the deserving poor, some of whom are mothers, poor mothers with young children, uh, uh, there are workers' compensation programs and other programs. The, um, the, the big federal program that we see is the Union Army Pension, in which the federal government spends about 40% of its budget in 1890, providing aid to those who served on the side of the North um, during, the, during the Civil War. And this is seen as like an old age assistance program since like one in four men uh, over the age of 60 is, is a Union Army veteran uh, in the North. When we look at the South, um, there are very few, uh, almost no programs as, as Trevon is explaining, um, except for the Confederate Pension Program. And that program uh, becomes important as Southern Democrats try to buy the vote of the old Confederate uh, soldier. Um, and it becomes popular and spreads across states because it's the only program really that can be passed that excludes uh, every other population except, uh, except whites, right? So it's a way to exclude um, black, parts of the black population that are in need of aid. Um, and then let me just say, okay, oh, sorry, just finally. Um, I, think, I think you might have a book on your hands. I don't know if you were planning one um, anyway, but, um, I, I would love to learn more about this, and I think there would be a wide a wide audience. And I will say, uh, lastly, that um, you know, if we're thinking about lessons from history that can be applied uh, to our discussions about racial inequality today, I'll say as as an academic, I think our largest impact, or at least for most of us anyway, uh, may be the way in which we tell history. And what I I really always enjoy about Trevon's work is that it, especially this work, is that we're we're presented with a story of a of a missed opportunity for for equality in the the post Reconstruction era, and that this work uh, really emphasizes, uh, at least to me, the way that we should not uh, sort of keep missing the these opportunities and and the importance of of studying the the history of Black politicians. Um, okay. Great, thanks so much. Um, I wanna turn things over to John now and then we'll go back to Trevon. Thank you, um, uh, Jay and, and, and Trevon and, uh, and Sherry for that um, uh, uh, fantastic set of papers that, that Trevon were, was able to present so succinctly. And uh, and Sherry for that great literature review and and that I, I I'm thankful for you because I, I means that I don't have to do the same, <laughs> but I do want to say in addition to the um uh, the the pathbreaking work that that Trevon is doing on black politicians in in the Reconstruction era I think what we have to recognize that that this is an era that really economic historians have studied hardly at all right I mean since Gerald James's classic uh, Branches Without Roots. There really hasn't been a, a kind of follow-up literature, really, until Trevon. You know, uh, in terms of in terms of the um, ability to kind of employ the methods of, of economic history uh, to to this era, and I think it, 
as Sherry is saying, it's partly to do with you know the problem problems that we face always we we, we will always face in studying official records pertaining to African Americans. Um, no matter what the records, there will always be problems, um, uh, and, and and there will always be especially problems for African Americans due to the racism of, the, of those officials. Um, but nonetheless, uh, I don't think that excuses us or excuses the lack, lack of studies of reconstruction in, in the economic history literature. So I'm extremely um, happy that Trevon is 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 um, blazing uh, the trail here and and leading us back to reconstruction, which you know is not only understudied in economic history. I think it's under 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 thought in American history more generally. Right? It's a period of American history that we're only beginning. To kind of um, uh, 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 teach in high school, you know, there, there are many American high school students who don't even learn about Reconstruction, um, and so I think that it's a yeah, it's vitally important work that that Trevon is doing. Um, I would I would sort of um, reserve my comment comments here to a brief um, set of uh, questions um, about the kind of deeper implications, or I don't know if deeper is the right word, but like the kind of um, I want to ask the kind of why question, right? So, um, not why why do black politicians matter, right? Well, what is it uh, that that is that is um, operating uh, in in your view, Trevon? Um, and and I think that um, we can think of that in a few ways. And I'm not sure if this is exhaustive of the ways we can think of the, the why. So, we can think of uh, black politicians mattering as individuals, right? That they tend to share perhaps with other black people at the same time a tendency to favor redistribution, education, uh, investments in education and other public services. And I think in that case, we might say that blackness here is a, functioning as a kind of proxy for a set of political and economic preferences that happen for, I think, relatively clear historical reasons to be correlated with blackness, right? That's one, one reason we could say that, that black politi blackness, black politicians matter, right? That they, um, that they, they are in some ways um, as individuals representative of, of, a, of, of a broader tendency among um, African Americans. We could also think that ha perhaps black politicians matter um, because they are committed not only to representing perhaps black constituents, perhaps, um, uh, you know, depending on the racial composition of their elected um, uh, uh, um, region, uh, uh, you know, they, they, there might be a, a representational issue here. But I think they're also perhaps we could think of them, uh, blackness here as, as a as a proxy, for, not for the uh, the kind of um, tendency more broadly to to favour uh, redistribution, education, and um, and other public services, but rather uh, a, a, as an active force, right? That that, that the black politicians, um, that blackness is here a kind of um, uh, more than a proxy and a correlation. That it represents a kind of political and ideological construct, right? That black politicians are are acting. In, the, in consciously in the interests of black people, right? Um, and we might think therefore um, that that influences their behavior, the behavior of these politicians directly. Uh, so here blackness would be again, more than a cor correlation or a proxy, but something like a, uh, an active uh, uh, agent in the, in, in the kind of difference. But finally, I think we could also perhaps wonder at least whether black politicians could matter for reasons that are particular to them as politicians, right? That, that blackness distinguishes black politicians from other politicians in ways which may or may not be shared uh, more broadly um, among African Americans at the time, right? So we might say here that black, blackness matters in a kind of narrower sense if it if it kind of selects for a specific set of characteristics that happen to be prevalent in the pool of potential politicians, those who are who are rep potentially re uh, going to be um, uh, running for election, and that again may or may not be characteristic of of, of blackness more broadly, um, or even of a conscious notion of blackness as an active force. And I asked that mostly, I asked that last question, mostly because I'm I'm kind of have this interest in the question of, 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 of free blacks, right? Free people of color, uh, which Trevon uh, employs as the instrument here. Um, and I'm interested in this question of, of, of how free people of color in, in the, um, in, during reconstruction, how they did and didn't align with freed people more generally, former slaves uh, in this period. Um, and, and I'm not interested in that because I'm worried about a violation of the exclusion restriction. That's not at all what I'm worried about, but I'm rather interested in it because I think in a way it's, it is very interesting to take free black people, free, free blacks as an instrument for 
black political representation more generally in that I think that was not just as Trevon saying that is rooted in the historical literature because in some ways I think it was um, the default assumption at the time right that, that that free blacks were the kind of the natural leaders of the southern black community right and and you know there's a lot to be said about that supposition and and you know Du Bois in Black Reconstruction you know he has a kind of very nuanced take on that right he points out that um that that free blacks tended to be more literate and that was obviously a factor in the uh, the the tendency to uh, run for election and 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 their their abilities as politicians were linked to their to their more literate um, background, and you know Du Bois writes about the 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 kind of salutary uh, a sort of um, aspiration of of what he calls you know intelligent free Negroes in Washington, Richmond, and Charleston, uh, who without exception he argues accepted the new responsibility of leading the emancipated slaves unselfishly and effectively, right? So there's a sense in which Du Bois is writing about the, the, the representation here as um, driven by a, a kind of an ideological and political uh, commitment to representation, not just as a kind of, not, it's not a function, it's more like this active notion of blackness I was describing, right? It's not, it's not just that they, free blacks happen to share the same interests, right, as, as the broader African-American community at this time, uh, sort of the, 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 particularly the free people, um, but that they, that they actively attempted to represent the emancipated slaves. And I think there's certainly a lot of evidence for that. Um, uh, but Du Bois also mentions in, in Black Reconstruction a kind of difficulty there, right? He mentions, um, he talks about the, the, the kind of, um, the, the, the commitment to uh, um, uh, enfranchisement on the one hand um, as a kind of distinct uh, dimension of, of, of the free black politicians, but he, he mentions that some supported property qualifications for enfranchisement. So the idea was that somehow, specifically in New Orleans, the, the gens de couleur, uh, many were, were, were interested in actually restricting um, the, um, the vote perhaps as a transitional measure, perhaps not. It's, it's not, it's not clear exactly to me um, where, the, where the divisions lay among the free people of color in New Orleans. Um, but, but Du Bois says, you know, that the, the, the kind of enfranchisement, uh, which he thinks it was, was a, what, the general commitment to enfran enfranchisement amongst free people of color was the sort of positive side of that. He also mentions what he says are sort of more limited dimensions of, 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 of the free uh, black leadership. Uh, so for instance, he talks about the fact that the economic thought of, of free black people at the time, he describes it as uh, characteristic of the ideals of the petty bourgeois. Um, he, he says that they believed in the accumulation of wealth and the exploitation of labor as the normal method of economic development and then acted then without, he says, um, uh, an awareness of the dangers of the powers of capital. Right, so Du Bois also has a kind of critique of the free black um, leadership of, of in, in, under reconstruction. Um, and that critique is developed by other authors uh, like Thomas Holt notably in his book, uh, Black Over White uh, about South Carolina during reconstruction uh, where Thomas Holt makes some big emphasis on the fact that some of these free black politicians uh, were, had been historically wealthy uh, both before reconstruction and then became very wealthy under reconstruction and just describes what he's, he sees as a kind of class difference uh, between uh, perhaps not all free blacks, but also, but generally between free blacks and the freedmen. Um, and, um, and that, according to Holt, you know, drives some of the kind of um, ways that, uh, similar to Du Bois, that the kind of alignment along questions of, of the vote wasn't necessarily correlated with some of these questions around land redistribution, for instance. And I think that maybe is maybe what, how we could get at some of the questions that, that Trevon mentions about the kind of limited effect on land redistribution. So Holt argues that um, uh, free people of color were less supportive of land redistribution than free than than, than the former slaves. Um, and, and Du Bois says something similar, right? That the, the, the question of land was sort of forced upon uh, the black leadership of the South by the rank and file, um, uh, rather than becoming kind of spontaneously. And just finally, um, I recently read uh, Jean Charles Houzeau's. Uh, book about the New, New Orleans Tribune, the first black newspaper of the South, 
um, which was le led by free people of color. A uh, fascinating book, if you want to read it, it's called My Passage at the New, Orle New Orleans Tribune uh, his, as an editor. Uh, and he describes the, 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 the defeat of the, of the New Orleans Tribune and more broadly the kind of um, redistributive policy that it, that it represented in New Orleans in the reconstruction era as, as rooted in the division between free people of color on the one hand who are kind of the main leaders of that paper and, um, and, um, and, and former slaves who, who often, uh, um, in, particularly in New Orleans, I think, uh, you saw that division being quite striking, not just on the questions of property qualifications as, as the paper supported at, at one point, um, but also on, I think, a more deeper kind of phenomenological distrust that, that Huzo describes between um, uh, uh, Jean de Couleur and, and the free, free people. Uh, so anyway, these are just sort of some references to put on the table. Uh, not because I'm questioning the instrument, but because I'm kind of interested in the instrument and how you, Trevon, see um, the, the, the role of, of free people of color uh, within the uh, black political uh, leadership of the, of the South. But thank you very much. Terrific, thank you. Um, so thanks to both discussants. I think that, that sets us up for a great conversation. So um, Trevon, I wanna start by just turning it Turning the floor back over to you. If there are any broad responses you have to, to um, comments the discussants raised, um, and then I've got a, a number of questions that came up from the talk and from the from the Q and A as well. Great, thank you. Um, and I'll say first, thank you both uh, to Shari and 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 to John and um, and shout outs in, in in two different directions. So while I was working on uh, these uh, projects, I was also co-authoring uh, with the Shari. I'll just uh, uh, unmask everyone uh, on a project uh, about the Union Army veterans and the discrimination they faced um, from physicians in, in that uh, program. And John very uh, thankfully provided me with some uh, key data on um, state constitutional elections um, during the Reconstruction era, which helped me to sort of fight referees about, <laughs> about, about the instrument. But, but let me um, respond to a couple of things that they, they mentioned and that I, I, I can describe. Um, uh, Shari talked about finding the politicians because they're easier to find, which I have uh, done. And so um, when you get into economic history, you end up doing things like collecting really cool data and, and sort of doing nothing with it. But um, I have followed the black politicians and their children and their grandchildren, and then took a representative sample of other African-Americans to sort of see differences in mobility. And so I have that data is just sitting on the cloud somewhere and I've done nothing with it. So. You've inspired me to actually look, go back and look at that again, but I'm, I'm a dean now, so I don't have time to do any of that. So I'll get someone else to actually go out, I guess, and do it for me. Um, but, uh, but I do have that that data there, and I think it's it's really um, uh, important. Um, I also take uh, to the point, I think this is actually related to something that John mentioned, but also something that, that Shari said in particular, which is that you know you really can lose the context if you're asking a very you know narrow question that can only be identified in, in a causal estimate. And so there are some great things that you know sort of this instrument of free blacks allows you to do, and there's some other things that it doesn't allow you to do, which is really sort of unpack um, some of the questions, um, John, that you, uh, you you brought up. If you're thinking about, in particular, the case of, of New Orleans, there were a lot of different implications there, and I think that one of the things to do. And then I test it for, and you really can't really do in the data is there are seriously different responses among free blacks, particularly that sort of cut along sort of urban rural um, cleavages. And part of that is because, you know, free blacks, I did, very important for people to understand, and I, I didn't talk about this before, are completely disenfranchised in the South overall. They're not participating in the political process. It does not mean that they're not economic agents in, in the South. And in areas like Charleston and in areas like New Orleans, um, they actually have um, decent levels in some instances of economic, um, uh, you know, I, I, call, I call it economic capital, but I really mean political economic capital, right? They're successful merchants in some instances, et cetera, et cetera. And so when emancipation comes, some of them really do view themselves as being sort of wholly apart from the, the black community in mass and certainly those who had just been in, in, um, were recently enslaved. And they were willing, um, and Du Bois talks about the fact in say um, New Orleans to sacrifice those recently emancipated um, African-Americans for their own political ends. In other words, they were totally fine to have, you know, literacy restrictions on uh, voting property ownership restrictions on voting, et cetera, because that would grant them the access to vote, but not the masses of, of, of African-American people. 
And so they were quite willing to do that, but what they sort of had to face and, and a fact with, and I think it sort of changes their political calculus, is just overt racism. They didn't want, you know, the, the, the white power structure didn't want any blacks voting at all. And it's very true, if they had wanted free blacks to vote, they would have granted free blacks the right to vote in, in, you know, before, uh, before the Civil War. And in fact, the last state that allowed free blacks to vote, we don't talk about this as much, we continue to talk about sort of um, enfranchisement, but there was an act of disenfranchisement of free blacks in the South in the antebellum era. Tennessee is the last state that allows um, free blacks to vote. And I believe that ends in 1835. And so, over the course of the antebellum period, you know, free blacks became a problem. And there was this idea that they could be separated as a class, but I think it confronted the larger sort of politics among the planner class of just not wanting, certainly not wanting a whole lot of free African Americans around, but not wanting to deal with them uh, politically. And it was never a fear of being outnumbered. And I think that's one of the most interesting aspects of that, particularly if we're thinking about this contemporary use of enslavement as an instrument for a lot of work that's going on in political science and American political development. There was never a fear about being outnumbered by African-Americans. That was, it's still just about black enfranchisement. And so that still applies there. And so I think it gives, you know, that, that leads to a whole different range of questions, but I think it's really along the lines of what you're thinking, John, of like, what were they thinking about their political allegiance? But I view that partially they were forced to consider the broader masses of African-Americans because politically they didn't have a choice. They were either going to all vote or none of them were going to vote. And they were either gonna represent their interests or they were not going to be elected to office. And so I think it was something that was foisted upon them in that current um, political, uh, political climate. The other thing I think when, when asking about sort of what does it mean for them to be uh, black representatives and sort of it gets me really to the definition of, of race. And so I've been thinking a long time about this. I, I don't, uh, Shari, have a, uh, a book project on black politicians. I have another book project, but it's not about black politicians, but it does marry this point that actually both of you are, are, are getting at. And I'm more convinced probably than ever before um, about Dorothy Roberts' definition uh, of race as it's not a social construct, it's certainly not a biological category. It's a political one, right? And, and if race is a political category, then it's inherently about economics because politics is how we actually decide to redistribute you know, um, resources in our society and make policy decisions about them. So if we're thinking then about race itself being a political construct, then you really get to a really interesting question of what is a black politician actually supposed to do? And so I haven't really thought through all of that part out of it yet, John, but certainly I think these black politicians are facing a unique you know, series of constraints. And another constraint that they're facing, of course, is the lack of, and we probably still face this in American politics today, the lack of true political choice for a lot of Black politicians and also for the Black electorate in general, in terms of being really beholden to one party, right? There just isn't a space in the post-bellum Democratic Party in the South for a Black politician. There was a really, really small window, but it was really tiny and it closed very, very, very fast. And if we think today, there's a, once again, a really, really small window for African-Americans to be active in, in, in the contemporary Republican party of, of today that was very different than the Republican party say of the 1950s and the Eisenhower administration, but it's changed radically over time. And that is also a feature I think of American politics that not you know begins in the reconstruction era and has continued to this day. And so I do think it you know, puts really unique constraints on black politicians um, in ways that others are, are not gonna be similarly uh, constrained. And so that's another dimension, I think, that gets added to that about what they're doing in terms of how they're you know, using their positions in office. Great, thank you. So I, there are a few questions that have been asked and, and there's some that have occurred to me. And so I'm gonna probably kind of merge some of those together. And maybe on the first couple that are more directly at, at the paper, Stravan, and then uh, a few questions that are broader maybe for everybody. Um, and so the, the first is really just thinking about that um, second paper and how should we think about what is causing the backlash there? And so one, one question that was asked is, should we think of it as anti-tax or maybe anti-school, right? Like if the resources are being raised for a purpose, are people responding to that purpose or are they responding to the revenues being raised? And I think the other question I would have is given your first paper, um, given that we're seeing the higher taxes and more education, 
in the places where there's suddenly more black politicians, is the response just the fact that there are black politicians and that's why there's a backlash or is it to what they're doing? Yeah, so I, I think I'll answer the, the second question uh, first is that what I find is in the area, so it's not just conditional on having a black politician and seeing the violence, it's having a black politician who's quite aggressive in tax policy, right? So even when I separate the sample, I just exclude the places that never elected any black politician. It's not just about black politicians. It's about black politicians and taxation, right? Those are the, those, the combination of those. And then for the first question, is it sort of anti-tax, is it anti-schooling? It's very difficult to separate them. Certainly what people said, and, and, and you know, this is how the you know, political arguments are made. We shouldn't be spending money to educate um, young black children because that's a waste of money. Right? And so both of these are actually you know, commingled together. It's not just taxation, it's also anti-schooling. But one thing that tells me that it, there, there certainly is this dimension about the, about the racial angle of this, because after redemption is over, right, and you've um, taken African-Americans out of the political process, what the Southern political class comes to understand is that they cannot go back to the antebellum norm of no public goods because whites, many of whom actually are now enfranchised because of, of, of reconstruction, demand these public goods in terms of public education. So they'd like to cut those budgets more, but the compromise becomes cutting the budgets overall and cutting the bu budgets disproportionately for black uh, education. One of the things that they have to do to make that happen is they have to be very anti-federal in their, in their policy about this. So where we had counties individually funding school, you know, school districts and funding schools, they consolidate that support at the state level because then it allows them to apportion resources by race and by pupil. And so the sort of data say that Bob Margo uses to look at race and schooling in the South is itself a function of a political process which takes the power of taxation for public education away from the local electorate and moves it to the state house. And that's a way of taking it out of the hands of say a majority black county, which might have an aggressive um, you know, property tax system for, to support public schools and moves, it to a, and moves it to the state house where they would have less direct say in how those resources are allocated. So there are many things that actually are completely anti-conservative small government that go on in the South as they navigate their way around the racial dimensions of the public goods that they're providing. Thanks, and I'll just raise now because this is very connected to one of the questions that was asked was saying, could you speak to the enduring impact of black politicians on educational investment? And the question said, my understanding from a recent biography of Richard T. Greener is that in South Carolina, lobbying for statewide educational investments in education endured after reconstruction, even as the University of South Carolina, for example, is resegregated. So that sounds like kind of that same story, same kind of narrative that, that you're providing there. Yeah, you know, the remaining black politicians in office were fighting on several different fronts and, and, and related fronts. And the main one that they wanted to keep was the establishment of the public education system, which they had. And it's also important to note that, you know, black politicians were not integrationist for the most part. These were completely racially segregated uh, educational systems, um, even in the smallest uh, counties, they weren't fighting for racial integration. But what they had during Reconstruction were certainly more equal levels of funding than we would see after 1890 or so. So um, they were fighting that, that aim. And what I saw is that they were able to close the gaps um, between Blacks and whites and literacy generations later, right? Um, even after um, uh, Reconstruction had come to an end. Um, but what I haven't been able to trace out is for subsequent generations who were later exposed to the post-reconstruction levels of, of public education investment, it's not as easy to estimate because you still have some mobility of African-Americans who certainly would move for better economic opportunities that could be related to educational opportunities for, for their children. Thanks. I, I wanna maybe broaden the conversation a little bit um, in part because of some of the questions point in this direction, I think just your research in general does is, is to think some about um, kind of what the kind of the, the long shadow of some of the things that take place here. So you've got this burst in an attempt for providing more education, but it's in some sense stamped out, right? You, you, the, the um, 
uh, the tax revenues go away and presumably some of that the local level or county level, I should say, the, the educational provision goes down, is how much do we see that stretching forward in terms of, you know, if you imagine the world where, you know, Black Reconstruction is not cut short in the way it was compared to what we get instead, how do we think about what kind of shadow that has left going forward on, in particular, you could think of educational inequality. Yeah, I, I think it goes forward in, in several different ways. And so I'm, I'm really glad that Shari mentioned uh, her paper on uh, Confederate uh, widows pensions because that was a very popular program that Southern Democrats were using to actually thwart populist movements um, that were springing up throughout the South um, in the late 19th century, early 20th century. And so it was about, it was about buying votes and it was about making sure that a truly populist movement would not begin in the South. And so there was still political competition, even though you, you know, taking African Americans out of the out of the political equation, there's still political competition. Another way this continues to roll forward is, and we haven't talked about this nearly as much, I think, in economic history are the ways in which you know, the segregated provision of services, say during um, the FDR administration in terms of allocating resources to rural areas in the depression um, in New Deal programming had to then be layered onto a segregated system. And you can fast forward from there to, you know, Martha Bailey has a paper about how Johnson fought the war on poverty in the 1960s. And the biggest thing that Johnson had to deal with was not the administration of his program and the federal formula that he was using. It was fighting Southern politicians who did not want a program that was explicitly non-discriminatory. They didn't want the resources at all. They stood to gain the most because it was genuinely going to target the areas that had high levels of poverty and the South had disproportionately high levels of poverty, but they did not want that system um, to be non-discriminatory as it would be provided. What they really wanted was an allotment of money to the state. The state can distribute the money for anti-poverty programs as it sees fit, largely through, of course, the racially segregated process. And what the Johnson administration had to do was directly expend that money at the federal level to get around those local political processes. And what Bailey actually shows is even though that program did target high poverty areas and did bring about some alleviation of poverty in those places, it accelerated their turn to conservative republicanism. So these poor areas actually became, received money and became actually more conservative as a result. And so I think the missing piece, and this gets back to Shari's point about context is the racialization of public policy is a longstanding feature of American politics about, and you know, when Shari talks about the deserving poor of the Confederate Widows uh, Program, that necessitates a discussion of the undeserving poor, right? Which from certainly um, the 1960s on has been a highly racialized uh, group of people for whom you can sort of always post up and have you know, diminished support for public programs um, that might lead to poverty alleviation, for example, or investment in early child education, all of these sorts of things that we think would bring about equality of opportunity are not genuinely met because they're highly racialized uh, politically. Thanks. And on this one, I'd love to um, bring anyone in on, as just broadening that same question of, rather than just focused on um, what it's meant for education inequality, but just as we think about what you're showing about what happened during Reconstruction at the front end of it, and then thinking about the way it's radically reversed. Um, how do we think about the long shadow that cast in terms of racial inequality in the United States, racial economic inequality, educational inequality, and, and more broadly, how do we think about the cutting short of Reconstruction in that way and, and what kind of shadow it's left? I don't know if Trevon, if you want to start, and then we could turn to uh, Sherry or John. You know, I, I think it casts a, a really long shadow in terms of uh, constraining what we think of as being sort of possible. If you, if you look at a lot of our discussions, even today, um, about sort of race in American politics more generally, they tend to always talk about the option that you know offends people the least, or that is. Um, the most progressive you can get while taking on um, essentially 
the most moderate uh, uh, conservative that you can get to support your program. There's always some sort of way in which there's this way in which we bargain about these sorts of things that, that to me eerily sounds very much like the reconstruction era, um, which arguably I would say was more successful than our current uh, political bargaining about issues uh, such as race. But I also think there's just a completely different way in which these discussions take place. I think another research topic that people probably would want to invest in that I'd be very interested in is the media's discussion of black politicians and aligning that with today's discussion, say of race and politics. I'd be really interested to see the parallels, the similarities, and also the differences um, in how those are discussed. And I think that's um, sort of the bigger, I think elephant in the room is the role of the media in this. We know that the media played a very large role in um, creating controversies, right? These very conservative newspapers could create controversies about um, things that we even talk about today, right? That reconstruction era politicians were fraudulent, they were wasting government money, they were uh, inept, they were, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And those are very similar to the sort of arguments that we see today in terms of media propaganda. And so those are other features that, you know, so are outside the scope of my project, but I think are important to understand the context in which these decisions are getting made. The more you read about the reconstruction era back to a point that John made, you know, it, it's strange that economic historians have sort of neglected this, but I think it's one of the most interesting areas in American political history, right? And the, the parallels to today, the, the parallels to the last 10 years are so strong that we will not be able to understand our current situation without really going back to that reconstruction time period. Thanks. Um, Sherry, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I, oh, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. I, I thoroughly agree with what uh, Trevon is saying, especially the, the second point. I think, I, I mean, it was just really struck when I was reading both papers about the way in which we tell history and, and a lot of that is reflected in what we see in, in media reports. And as, as economic historians, we also faced in our own literature, a lot of like these economic rationales for why things happen that, that kind of, um, you know, create norms of, of what we're willing to accept, like go, going back to um, Robert Fogel and Stanley Engerman's work on the efficiency of slavery. I mean, that the, the way of even asking that question, the kind of data that they uh, brought to it, you know, I think, I think that the changing the focus is really important. I think that, uh, nuance is really important. Um, and I think, I don't know if I'm being so, so very clear, but the, the more we um, think about how we uh, speak and um, how we tell history, I think that that will have a really great impact on, on, uh, on equality. I think there's just been a lot a sort of, I'll say lastly, I think there's been um, over a hundred years of, of kind of uh, pro providing rationales for, for why there is inequality. Um, and some of them are rooted in economics. Thanks, and uh, John. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, to sort of follow up or, or touch on the issue that um, Trevon mentioned, uh, where he, he described the, um, uh, the paper by Sherry on the Union Army, uh, sorry, the Confederate Army pensions and how this was a sort of substitute for populist measures at the time. And I, and I, and I wanted to emphasize that as a kind of way of thinking about this question of inequality, its reproduction, um, you know, my sense of the kind of comparative global history literature on um, uh, redistribution uh, and, and, and the provision of, of, of basic social services is that, you know, wealthy individuals rarely voluntarily give up their wealth, right? The, the, the way to, to establish um, high levels of redistribution is to, is to 
give poor people leverage over the uh, poor people to win leverage over over the rich and and that's something that is the the kind of the weakness of American labor, uh, I think, is a, is, a, is a central dimension to the story here. Uh, and, and the weakness of, the Ameri of American labor in the South um, flows through precisely this moment of the defeat of populism, the, 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 the production of Jim Crow, and the, 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 the triumph of the Southern planter class um, in that process. Um, so that I just would emphasize this kind of, um, uh, you know, material, political, economic dimension to that story um, uh, that everyone else is, is also describing. But yeah, thanks. Thanks. I wanted to come back to something John mentioned quickly and, and Trevon, you kind of flagged that you expected to talk more about it in, in Q&A, which is um, to think about the excludability of the instrument, which normally is a really annoying question. But I, I, I agree with John that in this case, it's kind of a fascinating question, right? Which is to think about what's different about these places that had more free blacks in them, um, because that's going to be the, the thing that's that's helping you get this causal identification. And so I, I know it's something you've thought more about. I just wonder if, if you want to speak a little bit to that of, of how you thought about the instrument broadly, and but also just more broadly that kind of question. Yeah, so in, in thinking about the instrument sort of broadly, I'm thinking about, look, I need something that's going to be um, related to black politicians that is not going to be related to sort of preferences redistribution. So it works, the history sort of works because free blacks are excluded from the political process, but they have a skill set and they're overrepresented actually among politicians. So if you have an area that just likes redistribution right before, right, it doesn't matter, right, how many free blacks are there or, or not before the Civil War, but it will affect how many blacks are actually elected, right? So in the, just the classic way of thinking about a, um, an instrument, the places that just happen to have more free blacks have a larger potential you know, number of black officials to have during reconstruction that's not related to these underlying preferences redistribution because you know, you, I'm trying to think about sort of the endogeneity between black officials and preferences redistribution. And then there are just a number of sort of technical checks that you can do on whether that instrument is sort of valid. But I think the broader question you know, that John raises is, you know, so what are these free Blacks actually doing? And there are a couple of things that I think are really interesting. And of course, in the editorial process and the refereeing process, this is sort of lost in, in sort of make, playing an instrument game or trying to sell an instrument, which is that the political and geographic restrictions on free Blacks were in fact getting worse and worse and worse over the antebellum period. And you know, free blacks were a problem within a problem, right? You have an enslavement regime, which is a problem, right? People are constantly running away. You have these problems of management. You have these problems of trying to extract as much um, value as you can um, from this, uh, you know, tyrannical and terror, you know, and, and terroristic sort of act. And at the same time, you have these emancipated black people who are not enslaved and who can be signals to the enslaved of what they could actually be, and you want to get rid of them. And so states over time are doing things which actually hold free blacks in place. So you have, for example, states that say you can't, you can move to the next county, but you can't move two counties over or you have to leave the state, right? If you're, if you're free blacks, right? The way that their geography is restricted. And these sorts of things become much more regularized. We, we don't think about this, but I, I'm impressed by two things, sort of you know, the history of free blacks and also Carrie Lee Merritt's work on poor whites, right, who are largely disenfranchised, driven off their land, competing um, um, in, a, in a low wage labor market. And a lot of these political um, disenfranchisement moves are then just applied to black people in general after emancipation. And so the South has a really strong history of doing things particularly to free blacks and to poor whites that they then explicitly racialize after um, redemption and use for several you know, generations in the Jim Crow era um, after that. But this is not, you know, we, we talk about Jim Crow and the development of Jim Crow as if there wasn't an antebellum experience with something very similar with citizens who were free and restricting them politically and restricting them economically. And the South had a lot more experience with that than people would like to realize. And, and part of that is we don't tell the history of, of poor whites and we tell the history of, of some free blacks but we don't tell the history necessarily of all free blacks because these are largely illiterate populations. And so it's really hard to get their histories told when they're not able to sort of participate in the writing of the history in the way that a traditional historical narrative would be formed. 
Thanks. So we, we just have a few minutes left. And I, I guess maybe um, given that it is February 28th, so it is the officially the end of Black History Month, and the three of you are, are all noted historians and economic historians in, in this studying this era, um, I'm just curious how you think broadly about what lessons people should know and what are the what are the things that you really take from that era to, when you think about the current world. Maybe we'll just go kind of in uh, reverse order. So if, and fairly just go ahead and start with John and then Sherry and then Trevon. Uh, trying to think on my feet and I'm, I'm afraid I, I don't have a, a, a sort of prepared uh, <laughs> um, simple lesson. I, I do think that the, particularly from these papers, uh, we get a much, much more careful, clear understanding of the effect of politicians and their behavior than we do in many of the papers that um, that Trevon is actually citing from more recent studies. And there's a way, I would say methodologically, that this these what these papers show is that history is not just a, a place to go to, as as Sherry said, to to kind of um, you know test uh, our, our models, but it, right, right, rather it's a it's a place to go, I think, to kind of really gain insight. And th these are the kind of uh, papers that demonstrate that. Um, but yeah, I, I haven't I haven't clarified any, any any substantive conclusions. But thank you. Oh, thanks. That's that's actually a great insight, uh, Sherry. Um, perhaps perhaps I'll press a little bit further on on what I was trying to say before. Um, I think it's 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 really important to change the way in which we. Um, think about inequality. So the middle of the 19th and early 20th century are periods of, of really high inequality and then uh, that are very similar in, in that sense to, to the inequality that we see today on, on a variety of different um, economic measures. And, and when uh, we face this, this kind of inequality, it gives a lot of power to whoever are the the elite to decide um, how what what redistribution is going to look like the extent to which there will be any sort of of redistribution and um, when they're when they're and for and for those at the bottom of the of the distribution uh, you start to see all of these rationales for why that the, why the system is okay, um, and why the inequality is is okay. So, just as one example, in in the middle of the nineteenth century, like with the Union Army pension system, for example, and the work that Trevan and I have, you know, there are these rationales by pension examiners, by doctors who are going to give out the pension based on on level of illness, there are rationales for why a Black veteran shouldn't receive the pension, even though he's just as deserving as the white. And, and I think we just need to be really careful about how, what we tell ourselves, what, what sort of messaging we put forth in an era of, of real inequality today that, that is similar uh, to the inequality that that we experience on many different uh, economic and other measures in, in, in the late 19th, early 20th century. Thanks. Um, Trevon, do you want to wrap us up? Um, I, I think, uh, sort of uh, parting things, I think one of the things that I have taken away from this, this project is it really isn't possible to do, I think uh, back to the point that both John and, and, and Shari were raising, to do work in the economic, economic history of these sorts of inequalities without thinking about the political process and the role of politics. Um, you, you just can't do it in a vacuum that thinks about human capital or, or capital more generally or technological change. All of this is filtered through in the American case, when we're thinking about racial inequality, a political process. And so it really necessitates putting the politics uh, front and center. Thanks very much. Um, and really, thanks to all three of you uh, for sharing, uh, Trevon, for sharing your work and for all three of you sharing your insights on this really fascinating topic. Um, I hope everyone uh, learned a lot. I know I did.
Um, and so please, as I said before, uh, stay tuned on the IAP website to see future events. And thanks everyone, have a good rest of your afternoon.